this is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, and we're once again at Nutmeg with our engineer, Frank Verderosa. Our guest this week is an actress, producer, former Miss America contestant, and current MeTV ambassador, who's been working in show business for an impressive six decades. She's appeared in films like Winterhawk, Return to Boggy Creek, and The Town That Dreaded Sundown, as well as dozens of TV shows, including Bonanza, 77 Sunset Strip, Maverick, The Joey Bishop Show, The Wild Wild West, Columbo, Fantasy Island, The Love Boat, Alf, Baywatch, Growing Pains, The Bold and the Beautiful, and Roseanne. She's also appeared in hundreds of theatrical productions around the world, starting her own one-woman show at the MGM Grand Hotel and Casino and published several books, including Marianne, Gilligan's Island Cookbook, and What? And what would Marianne do, a guide to life? In a 55-year career, she's shared the screen with Don Rickles, Phil Silvers, Joey Bishop, Elijah Cook Jr., Martin Landau, our pal Larry Stortz, and yes, even John MacGyver. But to millions of fans, she'll forever be known as the wholesome country girl, Mary Ann Summers, from the classic comedy Gilligan's Island. And I can't wait to ask her whether she thinks I'm a ginger or a Mary Ann. <laughs> Please welcome to the podcast the lovely and talented. Dawn Wells. Hello, hello. We got to hey, put Mrs. Dawn. Howell in that mix too. You see. <laughs> <laughs> right? Are you a ginger, a Marianne, or a Mrs. Or a Howell? Mrs. Howell. I'm a Mrs. Howell by now. I think. I don't know. <laughs> hey, thanks for doing the show, Dawn. Oh, this is so much fun. I'm glad to talk to you guys. So, what was? How do you describe a ginger and a Marianne? Yeah, explain the concept briefly. Oh, to it's our very listeners. simple. It's the girl next door that you want to marry, or it's the one night stand. That's all I can say. <laughs> Is that what it comes down to? <laughs> well, no. I think she, I think you had to be quite a mature person to take out ginger. You'd have to buy her a cocktail and get all dressed up, and Marianne would play baseball with you and be your best friend. And it's kind of the girl next door. I think. I think she's the marrying kind. I've heard you say that you like the, the, the way it works out because most people say they would rather be your Marianne. Yeah, of course, they're talking to me. They wouldn't say they'd right. rather have you. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You know, I'm not sure how that goes. And I feel sorry for her if, they, if you know, if they always say they're a Marianne fan to her. I just think as a 14-year-old boy, Marianne is the one you'd have the crush on. As a 25-year-old man, Ginger would be more your type. So Sherwood Schwartz knew what he was doing. He covered all the bases, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there was a weird story of one of the actresses who auditioned for Marianne, of all things. Oh, and I think that's a rumor. Oh, yeah? You know, oh, really? You're talking about Raquel Welch? Raquel Welch, yeah. yeah. Uh, there were three characters that were school teachers for the pilot. And when CBS uh, decided to buy it, they said, let's rewrite. Let's make the characters more interesting. So they wrote a movie star, a Marianne and, and a Mrs. Howell. And um, the casting, I think, was the difference between the girl next door and the sex symbol. And I think he just covered all the bases. I think it's a very interesting concept because as a 14-year-old boy, Marianne would have been your friend. She'd have been your friend if you were, you know, a girl. You've been buddies. But you had to be pretty sophisticated to appreciate a ginger. <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't you, even if Raquel Welch didn't audition, didn't you, you beat out something like 300 women? Well, yeah. And they, they said that she auditioned for us. I didn't see it. We, we auditioned for about a week at TV City, one after the other, you know, trying to match up the chemistry with the professors and the Mary Ann's, et cetera. Sure. And they said that she came in to audition. And I think it was before that BC fur bathing suit that she wore, because she'd have been a better ginger than a Mary Ann. She was so sexy. But I don't know where it was in, in her career at that stage. I'm not sure. Let's, let's talk about your co-stars. Okay. 
gossip? Uh, what are just we talking about? Name the first ones that pop into you. Like which ones you're the closest to? Well, that's interesting because there were no there was no discord. Um, I think the professor and I were grouped together because we were and the rest, you know, for the first couple of years. And uh, he had the best sense of humor, surprisingly enough, with Russell all of us. John, the late Russell Johnson, the, late Russell the Johnson, professor, the yeah. professor, yeah. he was very funny. And of course, Gilligan is just I thought probably an incredible talent. Physically, could bumble and fall out of trees and do everything. And he he was comedy timing was terrific. Alan and I used to hit golf balls together and share recipes. Mrs. Howell swam naked in her swimming pool every day until she was ninety two. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> she never invited me. I didn't get to do that. But she was a lovely lady. I think the, the least uh, contact I had was basically Ginger and Mr. Howell. I think we were the least, and there was no enemies or anything like that. But just sort of hang out with things you, people you have things in common with, you know? You did 39 episodes a year back then, didn't you, Don? Can you and imagine? You, yes. Yeah. And it took, what, a week to do an episode? Uh-huh. You guys spent a lot of time together. Uh, we did spend a lot of time together. And that's one of the things I'm, I'm the ambassador for MeTV. And what's so interesting to me is there's so many shows I never got to see. You work till 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night and you don't, all the shows that you're opposite and things you don't get a chance to see, like the Partridge Family and the Monkees and that kind of stuff. Oh, right. And especially yeah. the shows that were shooting when you guys were in production. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm catching up, which is just great. Now, That's fun. I heard a story that when Mrs. Howell died, there was something that she had that you wanted to keep for yourself. Really? I hope this is true. Well, yeah. Someone I, told me she had like a rose tree or something. Oh, a rose bush. Oh, a, yeah, rose, bu- a rose bush. Oh, yes. I called her her uh, business manager and I said, I know you're selling the house or anything, but could I have a couple of your roses? And I dug up three of her roses and they're in my yard. But one of the things that Natalie was just completely different than what she thought she was. She was very smart and very, very funny. And and when she left, uh, when she was leaving, she said, I want you all my best friends to get into my bar. And it was all papered in leopard painting, zebra painting. And she said, I just want you to Empty the bar while you can. So we all sat around and told Natalie's stories and drank everything in her bar, which was just really wonderful. Oh, that's great. <laughs> we, we, I was doing research, Dawn, and I didn't know she was married to the great character actor, Louis Calhoun. Louis Calhoun, yeah. From Duck Soup. Yes. Yeah. Was he in yeah, Duck he's, Soup? He's Groucho's nemesis. Yeah. Trent oh, really? Pino. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. He was and very I think dramatic, the I jungle, guess. Jungle, isn't he? In? Oh, he? oh, yes. He's in yes. the Asphalt Jungle. He's like that, an English teacher. With Marilyn Monroe and, um, and Sterling Hayden. Oh, I'll have to look at that. He yeah, was quite he had a an big actor. Career. Yeah, yeah. He was quite a drinker too, I guess. And and I heard that actually I think my mother was working in a department store at one point. And in she, Brooklyn? Uh it probably yeah. and and she was like, you know, a, a kid working and she one time saw Lewis Calhern <laughs> Love it. there and she remembers that he carried himself Exactly like you'd imagine Louis Calhoun to carry. Immaculately he like wore dressed a and everything. Cape. Yeah, he wore a cape that he threw around his shoulders. <laughs> and... You know, you hear funny <sighs> things too, Don. And, uh, you know, who knows if the Raquel Welch thing was apocryphal or not. I read that Natalie left some of her fortune, if not all of her fortune, to her teacup poodle. Is that true? No. Okay. She didn't have a teacup <laughs> poodle to begin with. She had a chihuahua. <laughs> So basic you and a find. German shepherd. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I don't know. She left a lot of her money to the motion picture home. She did. Yeah, she had no children, and and she left quite a bit, five or six or seven million dollars, I think, to the to the home. Uh huh. So basically, we're batting a thousand a year with our questions. <laughs> Who does your well, research? Well, maybe. True. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a strange thing with the theme song. That it was that weird thing where, like, in like the first one, it was like, and Gilligan and the other people and the rest. Oh, and yeah. the rest. The professor and I were the rest. As a matter of fact, we used to send little cards saying, "Love the rest." It was a billing issue. Uh, I think Ginger was the last person to get billed, and she, I think her contract said nobody after her. So after we went on for for a year, she, Gilligan said, "I'll put my." name in the back of the thing. This is just ridiculous. There's only seven people. So they renegotiated all of that. I mean, you know, I was brand new. I mean, I'd been working quite a bit as an ingenue doing all the guest star spots, but I was brand new to what was going on. You know, we didn't get a dime for the residuals. We're one of the longest running shows in history television, 50 years last year. Yeah, Never yeah. been off the air. Not 10 cents do we have. Sherwood Schwartz made a few bucks though. Yeah. I did a thing for CBS called uh, TV Moguls. Mm-hmm. And they were talking about the most successful, and I, I was quoted, he was quoted as saying he made $90 million on the reruns of Gilligan's Alone. I don't know whether that's true or not. I'm, but 
I'm I'm going to take a wild, wild guess that you didn't make anywhere near the money that Sherwood Schwartz made on Gilgis <laughs> Island. <laughs> no, no, he could have split a million dollars among seven of us. It would have been all right. That would have been nice. <laughs> I think, wasn't there money in writing the theme song? I mean, isn't that why, and I heard this, I hope this is true, that he wrote the Brady Bunch theme song as well yeah, yeah. as the Gilligan's Island theme song because there were residuals in the music. In everything. I mean, you don't realize it. Nowadays, everything's covered. But it was the first time I think VHS came out and we got paid for five runs of some little episode. Nowadays, you you know, Jim Backus used to be so mad. He was so cute. He was so cheap. And he would say, well, <laughs> Oh, he wasn't. I'll tell you a cute story. He was. He never had a dime in his pocket. But he kept saying, why aren't we going to get these residuals? Why aren't we? And it it was the law. I mean, people have taken it to court. You can't start over. Of course. You know? But he would would ask Natalie and I to lunch. Come on, girls. I'm going to take you to lunch. I don't know how many times we went, but he never had his wallet and never had a credit card. (laughs) And we'd always have to- I know someone like that. (laughs) (laughs) Whisper it to me when this is over. But at the end of the first year, Natalie presented him a bill worth $360. She said, Jim, this is the lunch you owe us. (laughs) Wow. This is a fun thing about Bacchus. I heard you say when he did Mr. Magoo, he sometimes snuck profanity in. Yes. He said, and we've, I've never heard it since he told us that. If you hear me mumbling, Dawn, I'm saying every dirty word you ever heard. Now, <laughs> I've never seen it since or heard it since then. We ought to go get a copy and play it and see if it's true. I don't know. <laughs> he was an interesting guy. You know, he, he, that, he always had that, that kind of upper crust New England thing. Oh, he's, yes. he's actually from Cleveland. Oh, wow. Which I found interesting. And he made comedy albums. He wrote humor books. He made yes. comedy albums. Yes. He, he was versatile. He did a lot. Yes. And he was a very nice man. And he worked very hard. I mean, he was, he was a good soul. Very funny in um, in it's a mad 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 oh, mad world. Yes. There's the drunk uh, the drunk pilot. And, and he was most the, proud of Rebel, Rebel Without a Cause, where he played the dramatic. Sure. Oh, yeah. did he, he have was... any stories about James Dean? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, yeah. I didn't hear it. But he was so proud of doing that film. He he also did one of my favorite Christmas carols, which was Mr. 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 Magoo's Magoo's. Christmas Carol. Mr. Carol, it... yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, he was a versatile guy. And he would tell you, he would tell you, cut cut this word out of it, you'll get a better laugh. Natalie said, I don't understand. You're always ad-libbing and you're always getting all the laughs. He said, well, practice it. Just practice it. Well, then you'd see the two of them ad-libbing. They never stopped talking. (laughs) They'd have to say, cut. Now, let's just stick to the script, can we? It was a great as long as we're talking about the old co-stars, too, tell us a little bit about uh, about Alan Hale Jr., who, oh. of course, came from a showbiz family. Can you imagine growing up with Errol Flynn and all those people in your house as a young boy? I mean, what a heaven it would be. He yeah. was a great guy. He was the same size as my dad. He would pick me up and give me a hug, and he loved to cook, so he'd stop by once in a while, and we'd share recipes. We'd go out and hit the golf ball at the Witsit course out there for a while. He was absolutely the kindest, sweetest, never heard a temper tantrum out of him. And at one one stage, I don't know what episode it was, the second year, he had to crawl out on a tree and, and save a little bird's nest or something. And we were shooting it and it was on a cement floor. And he crawled out on it and the branch broke and he fell on the cement and blah, 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 finished the day. He'd broken his wrist and he never said a word, finished the whole work day, came in the next day with his wrist all bandaged. He was a, a joy. He was a joy. Yeah, I remember it's so funny when you see his father pop up in all those Warner Brothers. Yeah, he's in a lot of them. Like, and they look alike, don't they? Yeah, there's a, oh, there's exactly. a strong, strong yeah. resemblance. Yeah. 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 It, I think his, he was a childhood friend of William Shallert's, Alan Hale Jr., Oh, that's which, a... which I found in doing research. I didn't know his mother was an actress, too. His mother was in silence. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, he came from a big showbiz family. I always loved the Laurel and Hardy dynamic. That oh, it was had. wonderful. And his yeah. granddaughter's doing stand-up. Samantha is Hale what, is doing stand-up. Uh-huh. What name? Under what name? Samantha Hale. Samantha Hale. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll look for her. Yeah, she's funny. Pretty and, too. And I remember, too, being out in L.A., and there was a restaurant, I don't know how long it mm-hmm. lasted, called Skipper's. Mm-hmm. And he on La Santa Boulevard, and he would greet you and shake your hand. He, he Lobster House, I think it was Alan Hale's Lobster House. I'm not sure what he called it, but he was there every night with his little captain's hat on and his blue shirt. <laughs> I love that man. I did. Every time he hugged me, he picked me up off the floor. It was just, it's the same size as my dad. So every time he hugged me, it was kind of like daddy was hugging me. It was cool. <laughs> and we should talk about Bob Denver too, since oh. you've, you, you've mentioned him. And uh, again, the research, the things I find in research, I did not know that he replaced Woody Allen in the original play and uh, played against, played against Sam, Sam on Broadway. Yeah. He was a real talent. Uh, you know, you can't teach comedy. And it came from his soul. He wasn't a wit. He wasn't a clever 
uh, uh, verbalization of what he did. He was physically uh, like elastic. He could fall out of trees and never hurt himself. And and he looked at the world at a different a different gaze. He he has he had a very severely retarded child, and Bobby would say to me, "It was his last child," and he'd say to me, "I am so lucky. I'm communicating with my son in a totally different way." I mean, he was a, quite a remarkable man, very smart, very talented, quite a loner, not funny in person, not not witty, you know, serious, into into an awful lot of atom bomb stuff and that kind of stuff. Little Patrick, his son, played uh, in Jack and the Beanstalk. He played. Bob and Alan was the giant. So little Patrick was five and dressed up in Gilligan's little outfit and everything. And I said, can he spend the weekend with me? He said, sure. So when he got ready to come home with me on Friday night, Bob said, no, he's probably going to sleep in the outfit. He's probably not going to take it off. And that's okay. That's all right. And as he got ready to leave, instead of his father saying, now you make, make sure you're a good boy and whatever, he got down on his knees and he took Patrick's hands and he said, now I just want you to give Marianne lots of love. And that's the last oh, thing he said. And Patrick slept in his little outfit with his little hat. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Now, now, did he, was it kind of difficult when people recognized him then, if he was a serious person, that they must have wanted him to be Gilligan yeah. when they saw him? Yeah, and I think it, he was uncomfortable with that, I think. I, I think he he's, he's, was a shy person, not really uh, outgoing, not trying to be witty. And I think it was kind of awkward for him. I think he was an actor is really what it was, as opposed yeah. to a comedian, where Jim would just be telling his stories one after the other. But Bob was not. Bob was very quiet and very private. Very smart. Very smart. Yeah, I read that in, in doing the research, I read that he, he kind of had a, a scientific analytical mind. He taught math, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he was interested in those things. Mm -hmm. And he Which was anti-pesticides before everybody thought they weren't any good. You that's know? right. That's he was right. Ahead he was of environmentally conscious. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the world thinks of him as made or – it's funny how people get – not stereotyped, but you people get – audiences think of that's their character. That's who they really are. That's people are. think of him as Maynard G. Krebs and, and Gilligan. And you think I would be a nice Marianne. I'm actually a B-I-T-C-H. You just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You can't believe that's true. But you know something? I found out I was doing some research. Downtown Los Angeles has some incredible theaters, bigger and more beautiful than Broadway. Been closed up all this time. I think there's one that they've remodeled because they use in films. And I was doing some research of a, of a show that I'm interested in doing. And I walked into one of the theaters, and one of the theaters was built by Charlie Chaplin. Do you know who Charlie Chaplin's best friend was? I know. Oh, I don't think. I know, but I don't want to give it away. I'll give, give you a hint. He was a scientist. Einstein? Yes. Yeah. Now, can you imagine those two brains? I mean, how do they connect in some way? And you'll see a picture of Charlie Chaplin walking in arm in arm with, with uh, uh, Einstein, but Mrs. Einstein's behind them, following him in. I, I just, I, I would love to be a fly on the wall with those two minds. It just fascinates I, me. I remember hearing an interview with Sid Caesar where when Sid Caesar was at his height with his show, somebody, uh, his secretary goes, oh, Mr. Caesar, Albert Einstein is on the phone. And he goes, oh, hang up, Albert Einstein's on the <laughs> phone. <laughs> and he like, you know. Thought it was a joke? Yeah, he slammed the phone <sighs> down. Because oh. uh, he thought, you know, how, why, you know. Why I mean, would they be if, calling if, me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if ever there was a crank call, uh, <laughs> hi, it's Albert Einstein. And and he said that uh, wow. Einstein died about two weeks later, <gasps> and um, he wanted to discuss uh, comedy and the human condition with oh. Sid Caesar. Wow. Oh, and he never took the call and never no. got to speak to him. Oh, no. wow. How interesting. Yeah, wouldn't that be? Oh. I didn't know Gilligan had a first name until I started doing research, and I've, seen, I've been watching Gilligan's Island for 40 years. And I don't think it's true. Not true. Also not oh, true. No, no. Well, they say, so they say a willy. Oh, yeah. My manager's saying, yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. Well, we had long discussions on the set. I don't okay. think there really was one. They kind of no think willy. there was a Willie Gilligan, but no. Sherwood well, wanted never... one name, just one name. He didn't want to have a first and second name. He wanted one name. Right. Well, they never called the skipper Jonas Grumby on the show, did they? No. You yeah. heard it on the radio once, I think. Oh, this is this was a weird bit of trivia. It's like the name of the boat was the minnow, mm -hmm. which everyone assumes, well, it's a little fish, a minnow. But it actually wasn't, uh, according to something I read. Yeah, and what was he? He was, he was, what was he? Yeah, what was his title? He, Head of he, television or something? He worked for the FCC. FCC, that's it. 
And Sherwood Schwartz hated him, and it was something <laughs> Minnow was his name. Well, so he named the boat the Minnow. Yeah. Minnow. Yeah. He got back at it, didn't he? <laughs> well, there's a wonderful story, too, about what you believe with television this day and age. But uh, we were filming maybe about the fifth or sixth week. Sherwood said, we're never going to get reruns. They hated us. The only reason we're on the air is because the audience gave such a good reaction. And we're at about the third or fourth episode, something like that. And Sherwood walks in with the Coast Guard. Big mucky mucks, five or six guys from the Coast Guard. And we stopped filming. And he said, the Coast Guard just has something they want to say to you. And the Coast Guard said, we have received many telegrams saying there are seven people stranded in the Pacific Ocean. Why can't you find them? (laughs) Now, does that tell you about the audience? I mean, does that tell you who we're appealing to? They believed it. They really believed it. We were out there floating around. (laughs) We had Dick Van Dyke on the show, Don, and he told, and I, I think this is true, that, that Jerry Van Dyke, his brother, was considered for yes. the Gilligan part or that Sherwood wanted him originally. Yeah. Dick claims that he talked him, he talked him out of doing it or he talked him into doing My Mother the Car. Mother I guess he car. had, I guess he had the choice. Yeah. And I think the um, there were two or three other people considered. Yeah, I think Jerry Van Dyke felt there'd be more respectability in doing a show about, about a, a guy who lives with his mother reincarnated as a car. <laughs> the great Ann Southern. Good Our researcher God. Paul is in the room. What do you got, Paul? Uh, I want to go back to uh, Minnow. Yeah, the Minnow. Oh, he's got, Paul's oh, got yes. the story on the Minnow here. Okay, give me the real one. Or Newton Norman Minnow is his full name. He was head of the FCC. FCC. And he's known for, it's now the 50th anniversary of his famous speech, in which he referred to television as a vast wasteland. That's right. That's right, a vast wasteland. How interesting. <laughs> How true. Didn't, didn't know that. So it was a little payback there. Yeah. You think comedy's easy, don't you? <laughs> they found that one out. I also read that as when Sherwood Schwartz was pitching the show, and I hope this is true because I love it, that a, that a CBS executive was pushing for the idea of an animated dinosaur. They've talked about that. Maybe the second season they were going to bring in a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. and somebody said, you're just going to see a foot in a chain. How are you going to get Gilligan and the dinosaur in a shot? I mean, it was so ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> when the show first came on, Don, I mean, you, I, I've heard, seen interviews with you, and you said that that pe- the, I guess it was the net, not the network, but the press was not kind to of the show. They thought it was ridiculous. Oh, thought it was the worst show ever written. Yeah, and the, and CBS didn't think that they'd had a prayer, but they showed it to an audience, and it was the highest rated audience reaction. And they said, "Well, we're not stupid. Let's keep it on the air." And we right. were actually in the top ten when we were canceled, which is also a remarkable uh, when you stop and think about it. Yeah, one of the one of the shows that went from black and white to color mm-hmm. back in those days. And Sherwood said, "We're probably never going to go to color. We probably won't get any reruns." And we just had our fiftieth anniversary, never been off the air. I would love to see it in another language. I'd love to see the song in Japanese or everybody talking in another language. Wouldn't that be fascinating? <laughs> yeah, there must be. Uh, yeah. There must be dubbed versions of it. Sure. Tell us about some of the censorship, too. I've heard you say you weren't allowed to show your belly button and the Howells had to sleep in twin beds. And Well, they always did that. I mean, I think the, the Van Dyke sure. slept in twin beds. That was kind of way back when. But I think this is the, I was the first short shorts on television. Uh-huh. And um, I designed them because I'm short and short-legged and Ginger's eight feet tall with these long legs. So I, I got the regular denim that's soft, you know, and I made it kind of come up so it would cover my navel and dip down on the side so my torso would look longer and my legs would look longer, blah, blah, blah. And and Tina couldn't show her cleavage either. And Sherwood's, his wife would say, how was your day, dear, at, at the office? Well, between Dawn's navel and Tina's cleavage, I was back at, called back and forth all day long because you could only show it for 30 seconds or something. Now look what's happening. You're topless on the piano singing. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> you know. Things have changed. Well, Barbara yeah. Eden famously couldn't show her navel either. That's right. On uh, Jeannie, on I Dream of Jeannie. I Dream of Jeannie. Can we hurt. ask you about some of the other things, Dawn, that you did when you first of all, let's let's go back. I mean, I don't know how many people know this. You were playing a farm girl from Kansas, but you yourself were actually from the gambling capital of Darn right. of America. Reno, Nevada. Reno and Las yeah. Vegas. My father yeah. had a hotel in Las Vegas. My great father owned the Thunderbird, uh-huh, right? Uh-huh. And my great great grandfather do- drove stagecoach during the gold rush. He drove uh the dignitaries for when the golden spike was Driven in Utah. My grandmother, my mother's mother, as a little girl, played at Piper Opera House, where Mark Twain was. I mean, I'm a real Westerner. Bar- Black Bart held up my other grandmother, robbed them all of their, tied them up and put them in the basement, robbed them all of their food. By the time they got out, he'd left a $50 gold piece on the 
table. I mean, I'm a real Westerner, and it's really kind of nice to go back. You know, Easterners, it's four or five generations. This is not that far back. So the stories that, that my mom has told me is really something. I'm very proud to be a Westerner. And I, I, I learned something else this year, too. I was reading an article about women, and Western women are stronger. And they go back to saying when you all landed in Massachusetts or North Carolina or wherever you were, those who went West, you know, how long did it take with a covered wagon to go West? You had sure. your babies on the way and you built tents on the way and you landed. Why in the world would anybody stop in Las Vegas? Why would you say, here, let's stop here. There's not any water or anything. So the women that, that did that were stronger women. And I think that there's an independence that, that the Western women have. They're not quite so socially um, graced, I guess is the right word. It's interesting, I think. Well, how did you get from from Reno? I know you were in a you were in a beauty pageant. You were Miss Nevada. Well, that means nothing, you know. There's the, three well, women from the whole state. <laughs> it's no big deal. How did you How did you make the uh, the transition to? Uh, you went to college in what Missouri? I went to Stevens College, all women right. in Missouri, and was really a uh, pre med. I love science, and my knees dislocated. I wanted to be a ballerina more than anything, and my knees dislocated, so I couldn't take any PE. So I took a. Uh, theater course instead of a PE course. And my, my professor said, you're good at this. You ought to major in this. I major in drama. Are you out of your mind? It means I'll never go to work. But I transferred to the University of Washington in Seattle and I double majored uh, theater and pre-med. And they asked me to run for Miss Nevada in the middle of my junior year. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I wonder if I could get up in front of a bunch of people and do an, a scene, you know, act and see how that was. Having no idea I'd win, as short as I am and all of that. And I did win, and I did go to the Miss America pageant and won a scholarship for the rest of my college education. And then when I when I got through, uh, when I was a senior, I said, I'll give myself two years. And if I'm not working, I'm going back to med school. So I went to work right away. I, I got a, a, a play with Mercedes McCambridge and Leon Ames. Uh, oh, Music Mercedes Box McCambridge. Yes. Wow, well, uh, there's she, a name. You the bet. Exorcist. And she was For really... the voice of the exorcist. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The voice of the demon. Yeah. And I did, I did a play with him and I got an agent because of that. And then, of course, I was a perfect ingenue, you know, the perfect type. You have sure. to be the perfect type. So, and, and you popped up in these classic early TV shows. Lots of them. Lots yeah. Of them. Like, well, that's all there was. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> what else was there? <laughs> Bonanza, 77 Sunset Strip, Maverick, uh, Hawaiian Eye. Can Wag- you, wagon Train. There's so wagon many. Train. Yeah. Law Can man. you tell us any Can of your imagine. memories about that? Well, not not a whole lot. I'm a Western girl, and I remember I was doing something at Universal, and I was supposed to be driving a buckboard. And they were going to put a stunt guy in. And I said, oh, I can do that. I've written, blame me. I can do that. Well, uh, the horse ran away with me, almost almost dumped me and Abraham Savar right in the middle of the of the field. The horses bucked, and it was quite an adventure. But, well, I've heard, I've heard you say that you went, you chose California because when you thought about going and acting, you, you chose California over New York because you thought New York. It was mostly musicals. Sing. That's right. Yeah, you couldn't musicals. sing. Uh-uh. I can tell you a lot of stories about my not singing if you want to. Sure, yes. Schwartz said this for he's a jolly good fellow. We're all going to sing it. I said, sure, I don't, I, I don't sing. He said, of course you do. This is the first or second episode. So we're all singing for he's a jolly good fellow. He said, Don, you out. Don't, don't, don't sing. You're getting everybody off here. <laughs> okay. So I've gone through that three or four times. Now I'm starring in a movie called Winterhawk and it's, we're up in the, uh, mountains of Montana and I'm playing a missionary and it was probably one of the most beautiful films ever. And the director said to me, now I want you, you're, I want you to lead the choir in Amazing Grace. I said, Charlie, I cannot sing. He said, yes, everybody can sing. No. So he started me. He said, you're right. You can't sing. So I'm a missionary, 1840 with the long skirts. So I'm standing in the middle of a field with all the missionaries around me. And he puts a girl between my legs, sitting on the grass, and I cover her with my skirt. And I'm mouthing, amazing grace, and she's singing through my skirt. <laughs> so about a year later, I was over here at, at one of the restaurants, and I was sitting at the bar talking to my friend, and I was telling this story about me singing through the skirt. And the woman next to me tapped me on the shoulder. She said, I was the woman under your skirt. <laughs> oh, that's funny. It is funny. I know that movie, Winter Hawk. Woody Strode is in it. Oh, Woody Strode is One of our favorite actors. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was a wonderful film, a beautiful film. It really yeah. was incredibly photographed, too. It was terrific. And you know who else turns up in that movie? Elijah this is Cook. kind of fun. Uh, Sashin Littlefeather. Yes, yeah, Sashin. Does that name mean anything to you? Oh, Marlon Brando. Marlon <laughs> yes. <laughs> when he wouldn't accept the Academy Award. Oh, that's right. 
Yeah, she was the uh, she was the one that went up and accepted the award for him. That was one of the most ridiculous things <laughs> to ever happen in Academy Award history. Yeah, I'll say. <laughs> And now here's some these these are uh, things that so many people have commented on already. So it's already a tired subject, but we got to hit on it. <laughs> okay. All the ridiculous things in Gilligan's Island, like they had a professor who couldn't vent flying machines, but couldn't figure out <laughs> how to get people off <laughs> well, the suspension the of hole disbelief. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sure would said, if you had two pretty girls on an on, on a island, would you try to fix the boat? Are you crazy? <laughs> yes, well said. <laughs> well, the question I, that, that I always heard was, why did Thurston Howell bring all his money? Why did he bring suitcases yes. of money for a three-hour tour? <laughs> and all our clothes. Why did we bring all, and all the clothes, clothes for a three-hour oh, tour? Oh, Ginger had a big Hollywood wardrobe. Yeah, she had 30 awesome. outfits. Yeah. <laughs> and we always looked good. Our hair was perfect. The false island uh-huh. just was amazing what we did on that island. <laughs> 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 I want to talk to a little bit more um, about um, about Russell Johnson because we were talking before we turned on the mics, Don, and he's in a, a favorite episode of the Twilight Zone. Oh yeah, of Gilbert's and mine, where he goes back in time to try to prevent John Wilkes Booth. Oh yes, oh yes, from shooting Lincoln. Have you seen that yes, one? Yes, yes, so oh, I've very forgotten good. that. Yes, but you, you guys, not only had a friendship, but you just you just alluded to it briefly before. But tell the tell the thing about the uh, first of all, I found it interesting that you performed in a prison together. Yes, Folsom. Folsom he was more frightened than I was. <laughs> <laughs> he said, what "You better there? get me out of here." <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know he was. He flew forty-four combat missions, and, and I did not know until Heart. his funeral that he won the Purple Heart. We knew that he was shot down in the Solomon Islands, but he was so he was just a joy and the funniest. He had the best sense of humor. He, he, he was a humble man. I mean, he never yes. revealed that he had, that he that he had uh-uh. a medal. Uh-uh. He was Tell lovely. Us, Tell us a little bit about the rest, how you guys bonded over that. Well, if we still send each other cards, love the rest, love the rest. And actually, Bob made the difference after the first year. And I think what really happened was, I think Ginger was cast before Russell and I were cast. And I'm sure the agent said she gets the last billing, period, nobody after her. So they had to, you know, make our contract. And after the first year, Bob said, that's just silly. There's seven people. And he went to, to, to Sherwood and Sherwood said, well, it's contractual. And he said, then put me back. I'll be at the back of the... I'll be on the rest as well. So because he said that, we got our credits. That's how it changed. Yeah. And they had to, they had to re-record the song, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. How sweet, though. How nice. To add that. But I think the rest is wonderful. Love the rest. We still love each other. The rest. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they had all those strange sequels to Gilligan's Island. Oh, oh the three TV movies. Yeah. No. 90 we Minutes to- of Gilligan's Island is way too much. You What'd you say? 90 minutes of Gilligan's Island is way too much. <laughs> well, there was a demand for it. I guess so. It's a popular show. Oh, it is. And oh. it's all over the world. Wouldn't you love to see it in Japanese or something? Yes, I, would love I really to see it. would. Yeah. Like, the most famous of those is the Harlem Globetrotters. Well, wait, there were three. Yeah. There was Rescue from Gilligan's Island <laughs> yes. in 78. And I'd like to point out that the director of that, I hope you remember Leslie Martinson. Of course I remember Leslie Martinson. He's 101. Is he, he still is, alive? He is still with us. <gasps> How he also wonderful! Di- he also directed the Batman movie, the Adam oh. West, Robin, uh, the Burt Ward Adam West feature film. They put out a feature feature film in '67. He's alive. Oh, 100, wow. 101. We should try to get him on. I think so. He was it, such a lovely man. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah. Is is that Batman movie the one where they have the shark? Yeah, the bat, anti bat shark repellent. <laughs> They made a feature to cash in on the Batman series, Don, and, okay. and, and, and he directed it. That was the first re- uh, Gilligan's Island uh, reunion. The second one was called The Castaways on Gilligan's Island in 79. We built and then the hotel. finally, yes, yes the yeah. famous classic. The classic Harlem <laughs> Globetrotters on Gilligan's the Island. They surf on and surf off and never told. tell anybody where they were. <laughs> wow. What is that? I said they surf on and surf off and you never don't tell anybody where you were. I well, mean, I remember I guess... watching them and I, have, I remember having trouble following following the, 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 the story, they got rescued and then they went back? Yeah, we went on a Christmas cruise and got marooned again. <laughs> well, the, one of the interesting things about the Harlem Globetrotters on Gilligan's Island, it, it, it guest starred a pre-Academy Award winning Martin Landau. Oh, my God. And yeah. Guy Sosby, you know Guy Sosby, one of the Globetrotters, a little comedian? 
I had a, 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 a cousin that was a little slow, and he would come down and watch the show from Reno. And he came down and watched when the Harlem Globetrotters were playing with us. And and uh, Randy was his name, and he was very sweet. And we, he went up and met Geese Osby and spoke with him for a few minutes. Two years later, two years later in Reno, Nevada, the Harlem Globetrotters came. My cousin took Randy to the game, and Geese walked right off the court and said, Hi, Randy, I haven't seen you in two years. How are you? Oh, that's Doesn't nice. Doesn't that tell you something? The premise of that, <laughs> the Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, Martin Landau, was it was the last role uh, with his wife, with Barbara Bain. It was the last, the last time. Yeah, they divorced. They divorced after that. Well, <laughs> he, he was the. I don't know if it had anything to do with it. Yeah, had a lot to if do ever with the there was a reason, <laughs> <laughs> he was a mad scientist, and he built he built robots. And the and the payoff was the robots had to play basketball against the Globetrotters. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's a I real wonder good plot, who won best writing that year. <laughs> <laughs> and the Howells suddenly had a son. That was the. the, 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 the where did that come from? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Suddenly a son turned up in the Harlem Globetrotters. Maybe it was a nephew. Dealing... I think it was a nephew. Was it? Yes, because Lovey couldn't have children, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> she just spoiled the wardrobe. I didn't know Lovey was barren. <laughs> <laughs> and the Scatman turned up in that one, Gil. Oh, my Scat- God. Scatman Crothers. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. You're good at this. Oh, it's just research. But I remember that. That movie I remember very well. <laughs> We've had to live it down over and over. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ask you about some of these other these other uh, uh, cr- credits and other things that you've done over the years, Dawn. See see uh, see how many of you can remember. I mean, <laughs> see if I can remember some, anything. Some of these, well, the old ones like Eighty Seventh Precinct and Lawman and Surfside Six and Hawaiian Eye. I mean, these are these are fun credits. Well, and that's uh, when I began. You know, I, I started yeah. and I started at Warner Brothers. They they put me under option for contract. They didn't pick up a contract, but I did all the shows. I, I'll tell you a cute story. I had a very small little agent, and uh, I went to an interview at Warner Brothers of some sort. And my agent called me. He said, Don, I had a great call this afternoon. I said, what? He said, well, Jack Warner called me. And he said, I just want to tell you, I had an intelligent conversation with an actress today. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, That's unless, a compliment. Oh, I didn't want to be in the movies. You know, I came here as a graduate and then I'll give myself some time and then I'll go back to school. So I, I wasn't interested in being a movie star or anything. And I think we had a conversation about an all-woman's college. We had a great time in the office, not auditioning particularly. And I thought it was really kind of a nice compliment that he called my agent and said, I actually had an intelligent conversation. Do you have any recollection of being on the Joey Bishop show in 1964? Yes, I do. And it was kind of live with an audience. Yeah. He was funny. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then you were in a show, and this is this is relevant because we just talked about this show on the podcast, The Invaders. Oh. With Roy Thinnes. With Roy Thinnes. Oh, that's where yes. – that, uh, he's the only guy who knew the world was taken over by aliens, and they all had deformed pinkies. <laughs> this mean anything well, to you, Tom. I don't remember that in the plot. but then... I, I once ran into Roy Thinnes somewhere, and I told him that I remembered that in the pinkies, and he, he was in shock. He didn't know. <laughs> He's quite an artist. I was at one of these autograph show things, and I bought one of his paintings. But, you know, we were filming. It was the first thing I did after Gilligan's Island. It was out in right, the Mojave Desert or something. It was, must have been 120 degrees, and I had on long Levi's and a long sleeve sweater and a long fall on my head. And they had to put burlap down when I walked because the sand would melt my tennis shoes. And the only thing that we had was one Joshua tree that we tried with an umbrella to stay under from the heat. It was 120 degrees. It was horrible. Just horrible. We should have gotten a stunt check for that. Do you remember anything about the Wild Wild West or Bonanza? Well, I just happen to know that I did a lot of the Wild West because I'm one of the few girls that's not taller than he is. Than Robert Conrad. (laughs) You heard that from my mouth, yes. Well, that's in your book about you talking about the apple boxes. Yeah. Well, the apple boxes was because of Tina. I mean, she was tall, and in order to get me in the scene, and Alan was tall, and Bob was tall. But, right. But Conrad was not very tall, and he didn't want a leading lady to be taller than he was. Isn't that fun? He's so, still with us, too. Yeah. So Conrad. they'd have him stand on a box? Yeah. Robert Conrad? Uh-huh. Yeah. I love that. Sometimes. I don't imagine all the time. I imagine, you know, there's some girls that were my height. But Damn, I remember Alan Ladd was sto- short, too. Alan Ladd was short. Alan Ladd, famously yeah. short, mm-hmm. yeah. I remember stories of actors and actresses where sometimes they'd go so far as to dig a small ditch if they were standing outside so the actress could stand in there and be shorter 
and her leading oh. man. Or maybe they maybe they did it so everybody's that is the, the same height when they're walking. I imagine they do some of that stuff. Oh yes. You know, to get everybody in the shot at this you can't do a six foot four and a five feet two girl in the same shot, maybe. I don't know. Although Tina and I were you know, she was very tall. I was on an apple box half the time when I was standing next to her, but every, I mean, I was the shortest one, but Natalie was about 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. Is it true that they said, and again, this, maybe my research is bad or my information is bad. Did they, did they tell Tina Louise that the show was going to focus on her, was going to center around an actress so. and her friends? Because you, re, you read that in some places. I don't know what you read. You know, I don't think so. I mean, she was cast as a movie star. She was perfect in the role. Yeah. She was never a problem on the st- on the set. She was very good at what she did. I, you know, I don't know what's that gossip column stuff. I don't know. I, if there was any anxiety going on, I didn't see it. I know Bob was very livid about, <clears throat> excuse me, Russell and I not getting the billing, but that was just wasn't a temper tantrum or anything. He just negotiated and right. got it back. That was admirable of him. It was very sweet of him. Very and nice. you did both voices. You did Marianne's voice and Ginger's voice for Gilligan, the animated series Gilligan's Planet. Yes, I did. <laughs> I feel so deceived. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. The first time I said, okay, let's go. Do, I'll do all the Marianne voices and then we'll come back and we'll do all the ginger voices. And after halfway through, I said, I can talk to myself. I can be ginger talking to Marianne. It was really fun. I enjoyed that. Go and ahead. here, very important trivia. Yeah, hit me. I think I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> I think ginger was Jewish. Tina Louise? Yeah. Or ginger Grant? No, <laughs> he ginger. Has, he, being a Jewish fella, uh, Don, he has an obsession with, with which celebrities were Jewish and which are. Which oh, you're saying the character uh, was Jewish? or you No, no, no. Tina Louise herself. Oh, maybe so. I don't know that. <clears throat> I don't know. I have a cute little story that when, when Tina married Les Crane at the wedding. And yes. <laughs> Jim Backus says, now when you guys get a divorce, who's going to get custody of the mirror? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Isn't that a cute story? They're both so now, good looking. <laughs> Now, what amazes me, you worked with Elijah Cook Jr.? Yes. Wilmer the Gunsel. Yes. Yeah. Now, can you can you tell us, because he was one of those guys, like every, you know, every Warner Brothers picture, every picture. he'd pop mm-hmm. up. Yeah. And so what was it like working with Elijah Cook Jr.? Well, and there were three or four of the other guys, too, that did all those Western movies and stuff together. Rory Calhoun, <clears throat> yeah. He was on one. Yeah. Yeah, he was in our show, but this is a winter hook with with Elijah Cook and Denver Pyle, you know, all the all mm-hmm. the old actors. And I tell you something, Cookie they called him, and he was so sweet. My grandmother passed away, <clears throat> excuse me, during the show, and I couldn't get off to go to the funeral. We were in the middle of the Rocky Mountains, and in the door of my hotel room the next morning was a bouquet of violets and a poem saying, "Life is like an onion." You peel off one layer at a time, sometimes you cry. And he left that for me when my grandmother died at the front of my door. Now, how he got violets in the middle of a town of cowboys and snow and whatever. I mean, he was a very sweet man. Very talented, this too. was but- Elijah Cook Jr. This, it's so amazing because anyone who knows his career knows, like, in movies, he's, like, the sleaziest, most <laughs> underhanded character yeah. you'll ever meet. How sweet. Wasn't that sweet? Yeah, that's an amazing story. We have to ask you about some of the other guest stars, because these are people that, obviously, we, we were telling you before that the show is, is kind of about old show business, and these names come up. Bill right. Silvers, for instance, oh, on, gosh, Gil- yes. on Gilligan's Island, yes. playing Harold Hecuba, yeah. the uh, the movie producer. Uh-huh. And that well, we did a take off on a- Shakespeare. Yes. That's right. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You had to do Hamlet. Uh-huh. I think what he's was, one of the investors. Glad to see you Productions is, a, is the company, and I think Glad to see you was Phil Silvers. Well, what was Phil Silvers like? Funny. Yeah. Very strong. Very, um, knew exactly what he wanted to do. You know, comedians are very interesting. They're very different personalities. Some of them are shy, and they just sparkle when the light comes on. And he was very much in control. He knew what was funny. Let's cut this line. This is funnier. He was, he was a genius of, with all that stuff. And how about when Zsa Zsa was on as Erica Tiffany Smith, as the socialite? She was very glamorous, and she was selling a Rolls Royce, and I got to drive it around the lot to see what it was like. It was like driving a diesel truck. (laughs) 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 So hard to turn a corner. She was exactly what you'd expect her to be. Don Rickles, on the other hand, kept us laughing night and day, and sure would say if it had been a five-day shoot, I wouldn't have hired him, because you can't laugh that 
many days in a row. He was wonderful. All That's our guest a weird episode. He plays a compulsive yeah. kidnapper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don Rickles. <laughs> and our pal Larry Storch was a bank robber. Yes. And here's another good one. Uh, a favorite of Gilbert's is yes. the actor John MacGyver. Oh, he was wonderful. The butterfly, wasn't he catching the he butterfly? He was the butterfly collector, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And Rory I, I Calhoun always... wandered through in that hunter's outfit, and Tina and oh. I just followed him drooling. He was the best yeah, looking thing the... you ever saw. <laughs> The send-up of The Most Dangerous Game, where uh, Rory Calhoun oh shows God. up as a big game hunter and decides he's going to hunt Gilligan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and of course, yeah, with, with John MacGyver, uh, he, who I've always been a fan of. You know. He keeps coming up on this show, yeah. Everything must be run according to schedule. <laughs> I am in charge of things. It must be run like a tight ship. <laughs> well done. Did you ever hear anybody do John McGuire? No, going? never before. There's more of a demand for it than ever. <laughs> the kids love it. We're going on the road. <laughs> the teens demand it. What about the great Sterling Holloway? Wow. Oh, he was wonderful. He, it was the pigeon, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. He yes. Was, he was lovely. And Hans Conried. Oh, I loved Hans Conried. Who played Wrong Way Feldman. Yeah. Yeah, I loved him too. <laughs> the pilot, the wayward pilot. Gosh, those good plots, weren't they? <laughs> and Vito Scotti. Oh, yes. With the voices. Yeah, who we love. We all we changed our too. voices or something. Russell said, I can't talk as fast as you, Dawn. I can't do your voice. It's so hard. Those, those dream sequences were the most fun. The vampire and the Mary Poppins thing. And Isn't that your favorite episode? The, yeah. the co- where you did yeah. the Cockney accent? The Cockney accent, accent sure. You got what was the plot of that one? I'm trying to remember. No earthly That's... idea. I think it was a Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It was a court. It was a court, it was a court yes. case. Was it a Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I'm, I'm remem- remembering the professor turning into Mr. Hyde. Yes. For some reason. Yes. And Gilligan in the coffin, whatever that was with his. And Ooh. Kurt Russell, a very young <gasps> Kurt Russell, I'll showed say, up as he the. He was 12. The Jungle Boy. And you know, it was so interesting because child actors, you always look around and see what's going to happen. But Bing was his father. And in between takes, he was out tossing the balls with him. He wasn't uh, a showbiz dad at all. He was taking him out and playing baseball. And he was a lovely young man. And speaking of actors, and this could be BS as well, was Carol O'Connor sought for the role of uh, the skipper? Well, it was kind of considered, I think. Yeah. I mean, Jerry Van Dyke, uh, I don't even know who they thought of for Bob. Somebody else for Bob. I don't know. Jerry Van Dyke would be Bob and, and... I don't know. I don't you know. Think, the you think about the so alternate right, universe version of Gilligan's Island. Tell us how much mail you were getting, Dawn. You were getting a lot. You were even getting wedding proposals. I was. Marriage I, proposals. I still am. Isn't You're that still amazing? Yeah. Now they're 95 when they're asking me. To. <laughs> <laughs> they were 25 and hunks then, but now who knows? No, I think Marianne was the marrying kind. I mean, I get the most fan mail. I got the most fan mail because right. I think a young girl would write to me and say, I'd like to be your best friend. And I've had so many soldiers say you were in my helmet. I wanted to come home and marry a Marianne. I wrote a book, What Would Marianne Do? Yes, and I so we really, have it right here. Yeah, and I really think it has a lot to say because it's now Kardashians and $500 purses. And, you know, raising a teenager today or a teenage girl today has got to be a horrendous experience. And, and I, think there's, I think Marianne had some values. I think she, she shared. She, she, she helped out. She was fair. She, she wasn't temperamental. She wasn't all about how she looked. I mean, I think she's a really good role model. Yeah, I, I read the book. It's would you, when did you publish it? Twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. What? Yeah, 15, yeah. Mary, What would Marianne do? Would a guide Marianne. to life. It's a fun, fun, quick read. Yeah, I'm very proud of it. I think it had a lot to say because my character. I can't go anywhere in the world. Marianne, Marianne. It's fascinating to me. What the simple little character that you think she is was sort of the rudder. She sort did of you say you were somewhere, uh, some remote location like the Solomon Islands yes, or somewhere, yes. and somebody came up to you? I've, I've climbed the Rwanda gorillas, and, and uh, five of my friends, I don't do anything athletic because of my knees, but I'm an adventuresome person. So we uh-huh. canoed through the Solomon Islands with a friend who had a photographer that knew where we were going. And I canoed up to the island of Sulufu. The chief's family had been chief for nine generations. His son was at the University of Fiji being studying to be a chief. And uh, <clears throat> they were all doing little war dances and everything. is no running water, no electricity, all the little huts up on stakes, you know. And mm-hmm. as we canoed up, the chief's wife went, I know you, to me. And I went, what? In the middle of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> she said, yes, I, in 1979, I went to nursing school 
in the Solomon Islands for a year, and I used to come home and watch you in black and white. Now, in the middle of nowhere. Can you That's imagine? power of television. Yeah, it is. That's very cool. Well, Here's and you liked my character, too. You'd be a friend of my character. I didn't play the witch or something, you know? You, Marianne would sure. have been your friend. Sure. Mm -hmm. Strange departure. You made a movie about Bigfoot called yes. Return to Boggy Creek. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's one of my highlights. Actually, <laughs> actually, it was fun because we were shooting in the swamps and uh -huh. we were, we were in Louisiana and I, you know, I come from Nevada. We've not even seen any water to begin with. And the, and the, the, the good old boys living in the swamps would come and bring their children with their pet rats on leashes. I mean, it pet really, rats, pet rats. <clears throat> and they were going to a cockfight, I think. And I said, I want to see that. You're not going to go to that. I said, I just want to see that. We're not taking you. It's too vicious. I mean, it was, it's back in the backwoods. It was quite an they, experience. They had pet rats, pet rats. On, on leashes. On leashes. Now, would the rats fight also, or is this just cockfighting? No. no. I mean, they just, it was like their little puppy. It was their pet. I mean, they weren't fighting the rats. That was, that was the bizarre. only cocker spaniel oh. they could get. Oh, God. Yeah, imagine. Well, I'll have some nightmares tonight. <laughs> Rats on leashes. Well, and they're swimming with water moccasins. Imagine what those swamps are like in Louisiana. It's pretty tough. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Dawn, you're still doing theater around the country because you've been in 100 productions. I say over 100 productions. Yeah. You did The Lion in Winter. You've done Steel Magnolias. What What are you doing now? You well, still? I, I, they're asking me to do Driving Miss Daisy, which I'm considering. Right. Yeah, and uh, I've done Love Lost and, and several of the vagina monologues and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm always looking for the role that kind of stretches me, you know. Driving Miss Daisy would be great. And you were in The Bold and the Beautiful recently? Well, I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> One time I was bold and beautiful. It was just great. I don't know. I'd never done a soap before, and I loved them, and it was quite an interesting experience to just walk on, not know anybody, and all the cameras are coming at you from every direction. I enjoyed uh -huh. it. I got a kick out of it. And tell us, too, about my wife is a big fan of Roseanne, and, and uh, I love the episode, the Roseanne episode with the flashbacks. Yes, wasn't that where, great? Where you guys show up. Uh-huh. Tell all us about the that characters. experience. Well, it was, it was fun. I mean, it was great. And it was, she was at her heyday, Roseanne was. And it was sure. I was playing Darlene. I do, I, do re, I do recall the boots of hers that I wore that must have weighed 50 pounds of boot. I don't know how the girl walked around after 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It was fun. It, it was fun. I mean, you don't realize when you're doing it, you'd have no idea the influence this show has had. As silly as it was, and the critics thought it was the stupidest thing ever, ever. And I can't go anywhere in the world. I mean, it's, it's, and it's everybody's, it's like the, 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 the soldiers saying, I want to come home and marry Marianne. It's something of America. It's something of who we are. It's something of how we are all raised that resonates. And I think that's one of the things that tickles me about MeTV, because when we were doing MeTV, the, you know, we had censors then. The shows were, 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 were censored and, and, and family style and people could watch them. And then when you're working, you don't get a chance to see it. And now it's a wonderful way to, to, uh, to influence morality. What, what can you teach your kid about somebody singing naked on the piano? But you watch the Brady Bunch or you watch a Gilligan's Island or you watch a, a dry I Dream of Jeannie when there's principles and ethics and things. So the MeTV has kind of brought that back. We, it's kind of a balance to what's going on in the rest of the world. And what is your official uh, – uh, capa what, what capacity are you working uh – well, I do a lot in of with them. You're, you're, they're calling you an ambassador. Yeah, I mean, I've done some promos for them and stuff, which is fun. You see me talking to to uh, Perry Mason and things like that, and then I do a, a personal appearances around the country for them, promoting the shows. Mm -hmm. What What did the actors think when the when did you guys think originally this is this is such a silly concept? We're out of here in thirteen weeks or twenty two oh, weeks. Oh, we or... couldn't believe it. You mean you've got a, a a a kid floating on and floating off and doesn't know where he was, and you've got rock and roll bands. We thought it was the stupidest thing, but of course the, the uh, rock band shows up the on mosquitoes, the island. <laughs> the mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, you know, you, you 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 did you believe Abbott and Costello? You know, I mean, you, you comedy is fantasy anyway, isn't it? No, I mean, amongst yourselves, you must have thought, yeah, this is this is absurd. I mean, we're going to get our checks and get out of here. You couldn't have imagined in your no. wildest dreams that you'd be talking about it five no. decades later. And they said, we're never sure. They said, we're never going to get reruns, you know, and we'll never go in color. Yeah. And you, here we you are. sure did. We sure did. And, you know, I mean, as an actress, I can say there's other roles that I feel that were more challenging and that I've really got my teeth into and loved what I was doing. But the character of Marianne has given me love and affection around the world. 
I mean, everybody loves the character. And yeah. it's, it's lovely to be greeted with somebody that likes you. If you'd have played a witch on a soap opera, they might be slapping your face. But it's, it's interesting. Gilligan's Island is one of those comfort shows where you just kind of put it on and, and you, you, know, you do your business or you walk out of the room or you yeah. do your chores and you come back. And it reminds you of your childhood. Yes. And then you'll pick up. You know, we've talked about the incidental music on the show. Do you remember this, Gil? Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> when like Gil Gillian's riding the bicycle yes, that yes, washes the clothes. Yes, yes. This stuff that's stuck in my head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have I a friend who's a musician. Do they compose that afterwards? Do they do that afterwards? I don't know, I don't but I, I have a friend who's a musician. I went to his house once and he said, Here, I'm going to play you something. And he started playing not the theme from Gilligan's Island, but what they, I guess they call the incidental yeah. music. The little. Yeah. The bridging the, little the pe- scenes. Uh-huh. I'm sorry? The bridging, the scenes. The bridging. And there, yeah. and there was that, there were several, you know, from Gilligan's Island. And you, when, the, when, they, when you guys were in trouble or the giant spider in the cave. Yes, And yes. There, was, there was music, there was music for that. And you, you'll be doing something in the house and you'll catch a glimpse of it on uh, yes. the set and say, and it takes you right back it to does. 1966. It's all those shows have that. Yeah. I remember them. you're instantly back. I remember the Munsters had... Dun 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 Yes, yes. And and of course on whenever uh Don Knotts would be brave. Oh, they'd play that that old highway patrol stuff. Right. Hey, you guys watch way too much television. Way, oh, way, way, way oh too much television. Oh, my God, you have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what else is happening now, uh, Dawn, as we wind down. I mean, uh, you're organizing film festivals. You've got cha- you're working with charities. Well, I run a family foundation in Reno called the Terry Lee Wells Foundation. We just built a Discovery Museum uh, connected with the Smithsonian. And for Reno, Nevada, that's a huge thing. I'm very, very, very proud of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a Children's Miracle Network telethon for 15 15 years and became very close to a young cystic fibrosis child and I didn't have a child so that has fulfilled my life. I ran a film actors boot camp up in Idaho for 10 years teaching you not how to act, how to get the job. You know, it's called show business. It's a business and and, sure. I, and I think that there's a lot of people that have to understand it's just you just can't show up and be talented. There's a lot more to it than that. And and I don't have children, so I I've I've done a lot of uh, charity work and I took care of my mom and I'm leading a wonderful life. I'm very happy. I'm healthy. And I wonder what I'm going to do tomorrow. What is Wishing Wells? The Wishing Wells Oh, collection. the Wishing Wells collection. I had a friend in a nursing home for 11 years. And when you see somebody that can't dress themselves and the people in the care in the convalescent homes don't have time. And I thought, why in the world are we wearing sweatshirts backwards and sweaters backwards when in a, in a theater you can change your costumes in 30 seconds with Velcro? Why can't they be in something pretty? So I designed a line of clothing. As a matter of fact, Mrs. Howell modeled for me. And it's just very difficult reaching the caregiver, reaching you, the son. It's your mother that needs it. But how do I get to you, the son, that says your, your mother needs it? It was, it was, I had it for about four years. And I had it, <clears throat> I went with a uh, pennies and they ripped me off. You know, I mean, they kind of stole the ideas. It's not an original idea anyway. It's just hard to reach the people. But it's a, I think it's such a necessity to keep your dignity no matter how long you're here. Well, you're doing so many admirable things. And you're working with elephants, too, or you did at some point. Oh, sakes, yes, the Elephant Sanctuary in Honewell, Tennessee. Can you believe it? It's not like a zoo. You can, you can, the the classes will come and see them, but they roam. They take them away from the circuses. I mean, you know, I've been to Africa five times, and you know when when you hear about elephants, never forget. If an elephant, if a herd goes by and there's a pile of bones, they will stop and touch every bone if it's a relative. Uh, they will wow. touch every boat and they will go on. But if it's if it's one of theirs, they will stay. I mean, they are incredible creatures. And to see that they've been tied up and, and chained to 7-Elevens in the middle of nowhere, it's just wonderful that we've we've managed to to help them. Now, haven't circuses, they're going to stop? I think, yes, they, I think Barnum and Bailey Barnum has and stopped gonna already. Stop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Imagine if they have to walk 50 miles, imagine them chained to a 7-Eleven store somewhere in the middle of a desert, standing all day long and not doing anything. That's oh, it's, cruel. It's That's shameful. Cruel. Yeah. It's shame. Don't get me started on animal rights, Don. We'll be here for hours. Okay. I've heard you say you want to be Betty White when you grow up. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Am I getting close? <laughs> <laughs> hasn't she had a hasn't she had a wonderful I think that's such a wonderful quote. Well it is. Hasn't she had a wonderful life and she's still We're, working and she's joyful yeah, and one yeah. of the nicest ladies ever. Oh yeah, and I yes, I I had 
you've worked, you've met Betty White several times. Oh yeah, in your travels, and she and always remembers the... too, doesn't she? Always what? remembers What's who that? you are. She always remembers who you are. Oh yes, yeah. And and I mean the idea that she's as old as she is and and in demand. Yes. It's and that amazing. show she was memorizing. That was that wasn't oh, oh, teleprompters. Yes. They had it was like doing a little play every week. And that she hosted Saturday Night Live in her 90s. Oh, yeah. And, you know. She was on, I was uh, writing for a talk show and uh, for CNN, and, and, and Betty White was a guest. And I said, I'm going to test her. I'm going to give her a line of dialogue from the Mary Tyler Moore show. Oh, yeah, and did Just you? Just for fun. Yeah. And I said, hey, I said, Betty, what, what happens to veal Prince Orloff when you leave him in a 375-degree oven? And she turned around, and she looked at me, and she went, he dies, <laughs> which is a line from Sue Ann Nimmons from 1976. from 1976. It made my month. I bet. Yeah, she's a nice lady. We'd she's love to lovely. get her on this show. Oh, you have to. Oh, yeah, it's a it's a, it's a project. So shall we wind and let yes, let this lady I, get back I, to I her? I just noticed a question you had down here. What do you got there? That Jonathan Winters uh, was a great help to you early in your career? Or that he was nice to you. It's in your book. Jonathan Winters. He was very nice to me because I was working with him. He was very kind about saying, let her get the laugh. Let her. He was very gentle and very sweet. Usually comedians are not that way. They're usually very selfish and try to take everything away from you, but he was not. Oh, I don't know what she's talking about. I don't either. (laughs) Have you two met, by the way? (laughs) I don't know where you're going there, Don. I don't either. I give up. (laughs) As I sneak out of the room. (laughs) Tiptoe, please. Well, this was fun. I enjoyed it. Thank oh. you guys for having me. Oh, thank you for taking the time, Don. Thank you. This I've was a it. this was a kick. And not so, only that, you were well prepared, and it's so nice because you kind of knew what we were talking about instead of just asking silly questions. I appreciate that. Oh, we didn't right. scratch the surface. I mean, we have all your credits here from from you know forty years, but it's only an hour show. That's right. <laughs> okay, I'm Gilbert Gottfried. This has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast. We're here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. Once again, we're recording at Nutmeg with our engineer, Frank Verderosa. And we've been talking to everyone's favorite girl on Gilligan's Island, Dawn Wells, Marianne herself. You still have the shorts, Dawn? Oh, you betcha. And I still look good in them, too. Thank you, Don. This was a treat for us. Thank you. Have a good life, you guys. You too. We'll talk to you again. Okay. Bye.